smells kind of like nice up here. I might, can I stay a little bit or? No? Okay, so I'm Sam and I am very fortunate to be able to work with Catherine. So I had about uh, seven or eight minutes warning that I was doing this, which there's probably about uh, 25 minutes of an introduction you could give for Catherine, right? But I know most of you here know her. If you don't, you probably shouldn't be here anyway. But um, <laughs> you know her as obviously the CEO of Common Skew, president of Rights Leave. She's a mom to three. She's the obviously prettier half of Mark combo. Um, but there's some things you don't know about her. Uh, let's see. She's on a million different boards. Every time I look at her calendar, I'm like, what, what is that that she's on? Who, who is that person she's mentoring? She gives back like crazy to the community, to the industry. She's a runner. She is a content writer. She hosts our Whiteboard Wednesdays every week. She um, goes on and on. And she goes to bed at 10 every night. I don't know how she does it. I'm not sure she's human. Um, none of us are. And she's never stressed. And her hair always looks good. <laughs> so it's very annoying. Um, so she's going to talk today about building a high performance team. But I think it's as someone on her team, um, and I truly, truly mean this, I have, and I've worked for a lot of people, I have never worked for anyone like her. Um, more inspiring, more empowering, more trusting. Um, you don't even know when you're getting criticism. You just somehow realize you've changed something and you really want to fix it to make her proud. <laughs> like, she's just um, a tremendous person, so there's no better person to talk today about this. Um, she obviously has a keen eye for talent. That's clear. But it's, <laughs> it, it takes more than just a keen eye, obviously. And uh, um, she's built a great team around her. And every person that works with her would all say this. They would follow her anywhere. She could start a toilet brush cleaning business, and we'd be like, let's go do it. So um, I'm super excited to introduce Catherine, my boss, my friend, my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. How, how are y'all doing? Are we having a good day so far? <laughs> yes. I need to curse Bobby for putting me after Rod Brown. Was that not an incredible talk? Just give it up again for Rod. It was amazing. <laughs> I will apologize in advance for my voice. I'm getting over a cold. I will also lay a little bit of blame on Elizabeth Manchel's limoncello last night. That <laughs> may have contributed a little bit to this voice. But <laughs> so um, hopefully you can all hear me. Please just raise your hands in the back if I need to be speaking louder. So I'll aim to project. And Yes. There you go. Okay. I don't know if any of you have ever seen a junior school kind of rowing team try and row for the first time. It's always a very entertaining sight. You've got, you know, some kid that's pushing the oar backwards. You've got one that's really weak on one side. Kind of things are going in circles or not really going necessarily as fast as they can. And what's amazing to watch over time, with some coaching and a really good coxie and kind of everyone starting to move in the same direction, is that it just starts going. And the momentum happens, and all of a sudden you see that boat kind of flying through the water. And that's when it's just magical to watch. So what I want to talk about today is how to create that within your companies, how to create a high-performing team to get that boat really flying in the water. So we're going to talk about four things today. We're going to talk about who to hire. I'm not going to tell you who to hire, to be clear. We're going to talk about how to think about roles. And we're going to talk about how to hire and spend the most amount of time on that. Um, we're then going to go through how to motivate and incent. And lastly, how to retain and develop. So starting off with who to hire. Last year, I did a session on mastering the scaling process at SKU Camp. And one of the things that I talked about was something called the people map. And essentially what this is, is a roadmap for the roles and the growth within your organization. 
And the further out that you can think about this, in terms of downstream, a couple years out, as to who you are going to need in specific roles, the more prepared you will be to add those people at the right time. So we're going to talk a little bit about kind of how to create this, but ultimately it's this thinking process around um, just having, giving some forethought as to what you're going to need kind of as you, as you grow. My favorite man, Jim Collins, um, talks about uh, the getting the right people in the right seats on the bus. Um, but the key thing you need to think about first is what are those seats? Like what do those seats look like? How do you even think about getting people in the right seats by defining kind of what the seat should be in the first place? So the process around laying that out, if we kind of look very um, holistically at the overall kind of process within the promotional products industry, this crosses kind of supplier and distributor. So starting off with you know, product selection and creation, um, often kind of, and um, that's a supplier role of, of um, going through the, the creation process in the first place. Education and ideation, you typically got sales and marketing functions within this, um, both to suppliers educating distributors, distributors kind of educating customers and selling to them. Order creation process, um, support functions, account coordinators, customer service people, um, the ones that are creating the orders on the distributor side and who are actually getting those orders into the system um, on the supplier side. Production and shipping, and the distributor part of the equation, that's the following up, the managing proofing, getting the tracking, kind of all those pieces, and on the supplier side of the equation, that could be a floor, uh, on the floor function, it could also be um, a communication function um, with distributors, and lastly, accounting. When you're small, you have people in your organization that may wear a whole lot of hats in this stream. And if you are a one-person company, you have worn all these hats at one point in time and know how stressful it is to be constantly kind of juggling all of these things. As you start to grow, you start specializing within this and ultimately you start having people kind of occupy um, boxes. And as you get even bigger, having people occupy boxes within the box. So you get down to this kind of specialization and function. And the key element of kind of defining roles and thinking about that people map is knowing kind of when it is you start adding people in those, starting to do that specialization within those functions and the timing around that. How to kind of forecast, um, you know, bandwidth issues and when someone's going to, um, you know, run out of capacity and ultimately seeing that ahead of time to get someone in before that person is you know, at capacity um, and being able to kind of take the risk to do that um, in, in advance. So ultimately, it's kind of looking at that whole you know, mechanism and thinking about um, how do you get to that increasing degree of specialization so you can free up time to be experts, people to be experts in specific roles as your company grows. So the piece kind of within this equation is looking at how does adding a role kind of impact the other seats on the bus? And what I mean by this is that if you look at um, someone who's doing a sales function as an example that's spanning kind of across uh, they're having to do, you know, follow up with the suppliers, they're having to do all the presentation creation, all the orders, as well as doing all the business development, that if you add someone to support them within that and you free up their time so that they can get out and do what they do best by going out and selling and doing business development, what is the impact on that? So by adding that support role, what is the impact to the person who's in the seat on the bus who's selling? And how can you think about um, thinking ahead, far enough ahead to be able to forecast when to add that so that you're not kind of doing it too late. And one of, the, one of the challenges that I see kind of with companies is that they take, especially with owners who are used to kind of doing everything themselves, that they think, oh, you know, it's, I'll just keep doing this because I can keep doing it. I should be the one kind of, you know, continuing to invoice the customers because I know how to do that. And it doesn't matter if I, you know, do that at nine o'clock at night because I can do it, I'm capable of doing it, but that's not the highest and best use of your time. So rather than kind of worrying about I need to have enough you know, profit or I need to have it be far enough along to kind of add people in these other roles that you got to take the risk. Okay? You got to take the risk before you're ready to say to entrust yourself to know that if you add someone in that function and that in incremental impact on the other seats in the bus is going to get that boat going faster, then it's worth it to do it before you feel you're ready because you're never necessarily going to feel that you're ready. So when you see this symbol in the corner, this three minutes, a little ticking clock, this is when you have to work. So what I want you to do, um, how many of you are thinking about adding someone to your team in 2019? How many of you experienced kind of losing someone on your team unexpectedly in this past year? 
Okay, so many of you who may not intend on hiring someone in 2019 may end up having to hire someone because you're, you're not necessarily expecting it. So I want you to kind of think about a role, either someone that you want to add to the team, someone, a function that you might need to replace, and I want you to write down three things. I want you to write down what the role will do, how will adding that role kind of interact and impact the rest of the, or interact with the rest of the organization, and what will the impact of that role be? Once you've written down those three things, I want you to put your hand up when you're done. That way I can know if we need a bit less than three minutes or a bit more than three minutes. So go. All right, we good? Everyone got a clear picture in their mind? Okay. So let's talk, now that you have this amazing person in vision that's gonna have this huge impact on your organization, let's talk about how to actually hire them. This is one of the hardest parts, um, I would say. And where this kind of begins is actually crafting a really good job posting. And I'm sure that a lot of you in this room have hired a lot of people kind of over the years. And when I look out and see kind of what a typical job posting looks like, they're often really boring. So how do you make it actually exciting to draw out kind of what to get someone excited about kind of working with you? So three parts of this we're gonna talk about, um, about you, meaning about the candidate, about us, um, meaning the company, and about the job. So I wanna give an example of a posting we had up recently for a sales role at CommonSQ. So we started off the about you. So again, you're trying to get the hook of getting that candidate to self-identify when they read that posting. So the first thing that we started out was trying to make it clear what stage in the career we were trying to attract. So look at the words that I've highlighted here. You're either fresh out of school or with a few years work experience. So making sure that people aren't, who don't have 15 years of sales experience were applying for this role. So just using the language to be able to, to get people to self-identify to begin with. The second piece of it was trying to draw out what makes them tick in terms of their disposition. So a quick learner, you love talking to people. We were looking for someone who is an extrovert, who gets excited and energized about getting on the phone regularly. You're a self-starter. This was not a role that, that someone was gonna be there to kind of micromanage them day in and day out. They need to be able to be, have that get up and go um, to be successful. Your listening skills. So even though they were, you know, needed someone who was an extrovert and loved talking to people, they needed to be an exceptional listener in this, to be successful kind of in this function. And lastly, you know that sales is a long game and that consistent follow-up wins every time. So someone who had exhibited um, tenacity in the past, kind of had that stick to um, that in order to be kind of successful in this role. So by, again, kind of using this language around trying to get people to self-identify um, who is gonna be a good fit for this role, that immediately when they kind of read this posting to begin with, they start thinking, okay, yeah, they're talking to me. I'm getting excited about this. So next up, talking about the company. Don't just say something like, you know, we're a promotional products distributor, you know, located in whatever. That doesn't get them excited about coming to work for you. So again, language here. We're on a mission to change the way small businesses operate. Mission. Get them excited about why it is they should get on that bus and be working with you. We don't just sell software, we care deeply. So this is a company that actually has heart. Like we, we value you know, our customers, we get excited about working with them. Again, kind of paint this picture that people are gonna, that are gonna be attracted to working for that kind of organization, like express that in the beginning. So you're, you're, um, you're being very clear about this and intentional. The third part, talking about the job. So start off kind of painting a picture at a pretty high level so they start to get a sense as to what they could potentially be getting themselves into. So again, language here, in this internally based role, we specifically use those words because this is not a face-to-face -face role that we are hiring for. It's someone that's gonna be mostly on the phone and over email. Um, in addition to being reactive, you'll be proactive. So someone that needed to have, again, that confidence and kind of self-starter, making it clear that it was gonna be very outbound in terms of the, um, the uh, focus of what the role would be. Once you've kind of painted that high level picture, get really detailed. One of the things that is the most challenging part when you go through the, the uh, whole process of hiring someone amazing and they get on the job in a weekend, they start realizing what it is they're gonna do on a day-to-day -day basis and it's a complete mismatch with what they thought. Guess what, they're gonna be out the door quickly. So if you can avoid that mismatch in expectations from the beginning by being super clear about what, it, what the day-to-day -day looks like in this job, then you're gonna have a far greater likelihood of retaining that person when they get in. Close with your secret sauce. 
apart from kind of mission and vision and all these things, what's magical about working at your company? What is it that makes you special? What's going to get them excited? Are there certain you know, perks or certain things about your culture or your values? Um, do you have a dog that likes to cuddle with Skibot you know, in your office? Um, what are things that you can showcase there in terms of either you know, photos or, or things that kind of get someone excited about working for you? So the more you kind of leak, you draw them in in the beginning about getting them to kind of self-identify, you get them excited about that, you know, the mission and the vision and the end kind of leave them finishing reading that job posting with like, oh my God, I just want to work at that company so badly. So make your, your posting exciting. Make them, you know, that, uh, you, that you're going to be flooded with candidates because you've done such a great job of kind of selling your organization. So you're going to work again, three minutes. That, vis that, that role that you identified in the beginning, write the job posting. Don't get focused on like wordsmithing and making it sound perfect. Just like put a bunch of stuff down on paper about the candidate, about you as a company, about the job. Just jot things down. How many of you felt excited about working at your own company after writing that? <laughs> so this is obviously not something that you can accomplish in three minutes, but the idea was to get you thinking about it and to get some initial thoughts down. Okay, so once you've started to attract some really awesome candidates, um, the interview process begins. I couldn't resist, sorry. <laughs> Something that um, I started doing about a year ago, which I found to be incredibly effective, was doing um, a first round of interviewing on the phone. So going through an initial batch of candidates, a quick you know, five, 10 minute phone interview, and what I found um, was really remarkable out of this is that, first of all, it saved an enormous amount of time. When someone comes in for an in-person interview and you know in the first five minutes that they are just not going to be the right fit and you feel this like obligation to give them another five, ten minutes because you feel bad about the fact that they came in and all of a sudden you've wasted your time and you've wasted theirs. So being able to do kind of that quick phone pass to do that initial screening um, saves a huge amount of time and really narrows down your candidates to um, a much smaller pool. Once you then actually um, bring that narrow down group in for an in-person interview, the key is to have actually thought through some effective interview questions. So too often, um, interviews, interviews tend to be way too kind of skills-based. And if you're trying to identify that the person that you're interviewing has done before what it is that you are hiring them for, they're not gonna be the right fit for the role. If they've already done that job somewhere else, they're gonna be bored pretty quickly coming into that role in your organization. So the key thing is that you wanna find someone who has the potential to do what it is that you're hiring them for. So um, personality, aptitude, motivation, kind of all of those things are way more important than skills. So if you see kind of in this list of priority in terms of the interview question, skills is the last thing you should be asking about. So the first thing is trying to draw out kind of where do they have transferable skills that are going to be applicable to the role that you are hiring for. When we, on the right sleeve side, when we've been hiring for um, account coordinator roles, often they don't have a lot of work experience. They're coming kind of fresh out of school, so it's harder to be able to take a look at um, what they've done in the past and how that can apply. But ultimately, a lot of people that we have hired have had retail experience before. Um, they've worked at restaurants or had some kind of customer service experience, and all of those skills have been totally transferable, juggling you know, time management, um, dealing with difficult customers, kind of all those things. So drawing out um, those types of experiences um, are key to being able to, um, to highlight kind of the applicability of what they, what they may have done. Don't ask hypothetical questions. You're just going to get a hypothetical answer. It's not giving you any insight into the candidate by doing that. The second piece of it is really trying to unpack what it is that makes them tick. If they're going to be successful in your kind of culture, you have to try and figure this out in the interview process as to whether or not they're going to fit. Some of the questions that I've found um, have been the most interesting and have started kind of great conversations in an interview is what do people do for fun? What do they read? Like, find out you know, what they're curious about. What, are they, you know, what gets them up in the morning? What are they passionate about? What kind of drives them? Like, having those types of conversations as to you know, the boring, like, where did you go to school and tell me about your first job? Like, getting at the, at the root of kind of who, who they are and why they're interesting. Because ultimately, if you can bring someone on board who has an interesting life kind of outside of work, they're gonna, going to contribute way more to your organization and also be way more interesting to your customers. So get at those types of questions. Um, and it also makes for a way more interesting interview. <laughs> much better sense of kind of who they are um, at the end of that. Remember when you are interviewing that it is your job as the interviewer to bring out the best in the candidate. 
Don't try and like ask them questions to trip them up. Don't try and put them on the spot. Um, ultimately, try and make them relax, kind of bring out the best, because you're going to see kind of who they are and what they can bring to the table. If you can create an environment where they feel that they kind of feel safe and, and comfortable and can kind of really shine as to what make, what, who they are and what makes them tick. As I said, kind of last thing um, about skills. So certainly, you know, get into it and understand kind of what it is that they have done and what they can bring to the table, but this should be the, the least important kind of part um, of, the, of the overall interview process. So based on that, write a couple interview questions. What are the kinds of things that are important to you in terms of figuring out from a candidate as to why they're gonna fit within your organization? All right, see I wasn't kidding this morning when I said I was gonna make you guys work. <laughs> Okay, so you've done this great, and you've ran this amazing interview, you found the perfect candidate, and you want to progress to this next stage. Be prepared for this stage. Ha write down in advance what kind of reference questions you would want to ask references. Have an offer template ready to go. You want to be able to move fast once you get to this stage. I did a Whiteboard Wednesday video um, a little while ago on how to make a hire in 10 days or how to make a hire in six days, as Dave and I like to joke. But uh, the key is that if you find a great candidate, you want to make sure that you're not going to lose them to another potential company because you've been slow kind of in this process. So there's no reason to drag this out and wait. If you've got an open position that you want to fill, that you want to fill and you've got a great candidate, move fast. So do your reference checking kind of within a day. Get an offer at the door as soon as you feel confident kind of that you've done your homework on that and aim to kind of give them a, um, a deadline within a few days after that to give you an answer. There is no reason from the point in time when you put a job posting up there and start doing kind of the interviewing through to getting an offer on the table that you can't do within 10 days. So I would challenge you to think about that, to kind of move fast within this. So you've hired this amazing candidate. Don't screw it up by making their onboarding experience terrible. <laughs> A new employee makes a decision uh, by the sixth week on the job as to whether or not they see a future for themselves in, that, in this organization. So the key part is that you want to wow them in that first week on the job. You don't get a second chance to make a first impression, so be prepared. Three things that are so important in this. Make the environment totally ready, their desk, like whatever else is applicable in terms of the physical environment. Make sure all the tools they need to be successful are ready to go. So whether that's a phone, whether it's software, you know, what are the different pieces kind of they need ready for them so they can hit the ground running. Do a really, really detailed training schedule. We lay out at a minimum kind of three days, literally to the minute of every single day and likely kind of beyond that, um, depending on the role. So literally, kind of from the moment in time that person arrives at the office through to the point in time they leave at the end of the day for those first couple days, they should know exactly what they are doing. And you should have given really deep thought into how, what it is that they need to know kind of in that initial week in order to be successful. Day one always involves a team lunch. Make sure that they can meet everyone they're gonna be working with, that they feel welcomed and part of that culture from the first moment. Day two, we typically do um, a lunch kind of with the individual's manager so they can start to develop that relationship and kind of get to know them better. And if there's the opportunity to set them up with a peer mentor in the organization, so someone that's either at a similar level to them that they're not gonna be working with directly, that they can feel comfortable like asking questions to that they might not feel comfortable asking their direct manager. If you have the ability to set them up with someone like that, have them go for lunch with that person on day three. Have that person kind of show them like the lay of the land, where, where are the cool kind of you know, places to get takeout um, around the office or just kind of navigating like what people do for lunch. Like make sure they aren't kind of on their own like trying to figure out you know, what to do in that uh, initial day because that can be super uncomfortable. And the more that you can kind of wrap your arms around that, um, that new employee from day one, the more they're gonna feel as if they're part of the team from the beginning. And lastly, don't forget to give them welcome swag. I'm looking at you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in this business, like show them the magic of promotional products and the minute they walk in the door, kind of make them like so excited about the brand they're now working for to have that waiting at their desk from the moment they walk in. So things they can wear, things they can use, whether it's, you know, a notebook, a water bottle, you know, a, um, a wearable, like something that gets them excited to kind of put that on from the moment that they, they join the team and make them feel part of the team. So don't just take, you know, self promo that you have lying around and kind of slap it on the desk, like actually be thoughtful about what it is that kind of an onboarding kind of kit looks like to make them feel welcome from the beginning. Okay, session three on motivating and incenting. So you've hired this amazing person, you've onboarded them successfully, they've hit the ground running, they're knocking out of the park, um, you're super excited about it. So um, how do you, actually sorry, backing up for a minute. 
um, designing kind of what it is that their actual compensation plan is going to look like. So define that kind of from the beginning. Three key pieces um, that you want to be able to outline here. So understanding motivation, understanding that role's kind of contribution to the business, and understanding the metrics as to how it is that you measure success. So talking about motivation to begin with, every individual is motivated differently. Don't think that just because you're hiring for the same role, it means that you should design compensation exactly the same. The overall value as to what it is that you are, you are offering from a compensation perspective should be comparable within the same role. If someone's doing the same function, has the same um, experience, so that you're, you are creating kind of parity there. But ultimately, the mix as to what it is that goes into that compensation plan does not need to be the same. So think about what it is that the levers are that you have to work with. So the financial piece of it is one part of the equation. Um, you know, base salary, bonus, um, commission, you know, whatever those pieces are going to be kind of of that financial piece. But that's only one lever. The second lever might be time off. Some people value this kind of far, far more than they value compensation. So think about that as an important thing that you have in your pocket to negotiate with. Um, the third piece may be um, what it is that the kind of the, the organizational values are. So are you, do you allow time off for volunteering? Um, are there things that they, they can get involved with from a community support perspective within the organization? So things that you can do that are an attractive kind of piece of the overall compensation plan and also benefits. So that's, uh, I mean, I know particularly in the US, it's a pretty um, key piece of the equation and how it is that you can structure kind of a plan around that. So those are four examples of levers. You might have others that you can think of um, within your organization that are things that you can play with. So be thoughtful in terms of how it is that you're putting together a compensation plan to find that alignment with what it is that makes that individual person tick. It's a pretty crazy stat that I heard um, last week that by 2025, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. That's a pretty mind-boggling number when you think about that. So you've got this you know, big wave of boomers moving through. Gen X was a very small generation in comparison to the boomers and, and to the millennials. And so you have this huge surge that are of, the, of the millennials that are now moving into this kind of stage of domination in the workforce. This is going to play a really, really big role in terms of how it is that you think about compensation um, because the motivations are different there. And it can be, you know, whether it's that's around kind of, you know, better work-life balance, whether it's around kind of around mission, mission and purpose, that all of these things kind of are playing um, a much more significant factor than simply being able to put together kind of a financial plan that's attractive um, for someone. So bear this in mind, kind of as you're thinking about um, compensation structure. And the study that Deloitte did recently on millennials and having them rank what it was that was important to them, you can see here compensation and benefits um, scored a 12 on a score. Culture and values was two and a half times more important. That is huge in terms of how it is that you think about what it is that motivates and incents your team. So how do you get kind of someone excited about aligning themselves with your organization when compensation is not going to be what makes them tick? From a contribution perspective, when you're thinking about how to actually look at the, fin the financial piece of this, you have to look at what the contribution is of that specific role to the momentum of the bus. In a sales role, it's a little bit clear because you can say, you know, here is a goal that we think this person should be able to achieve, you know, average kind of margin and kind of reverse engineer it from there. It's a little bit trickier when you're looking at kind of a support function or um, one that's not kind of directly aligned to, to a sales goal, but you still need to do the math around it. So if you bring on you know, a coordinator, what does that enable the, the salesperson they're supporting to do? How does that change the contribution to the business? And that starts to become the starting point for figuring out the value from a financial perspective of what you can afford to pay um, that particular person. Again, this is where the risk part of the equation you know, comes into things. So you have to be comfortable with saying that I, can, I have confidence in you know, my ability to bring this role in and to be able to drive kind of, you know, the value out of it and figure out the contribution as opposed to saying you know, we need to have to see the profit first or we need to be comfort more comfortable kind of from that financial piece um, before we're willing to take the risk. So having done a little bit of you know, figuring out kind of the math on it, I think it makes you a lot more comfortable with knowing kind of what you have to work with um, to begin with in terms of overall kind of um, financial, the financial piece of the compensation and then putting together all the other levers around that. 
from a metrics perspective, um, you've got the two pieces of the equation that you need to look at, and the key, the key aspect of this is transparency, so that not only does the individual know what it is that success looks like, but also that the manager is clear on that as well, and those metrics need to be available to both easily and um, with frequency, so it shouldn't be something that gets reported on kind of um, at the end of the month, the difference between kind of lagging and leading indicators, lagging indicators being the ones that are in the rear view mirror, they already happened, you know, sales numbers as an example, um, once it's finished, you can't impact it, versus leading indicators, what's coming down the road. Um, so in a, you know, in a sales role, lagging indicators um, would be kind of the invoiced amount um, at the end of the day, but the leading ones that are super important to make sure they're on track are you know, number of meetings, the pipeline, like figuring out all those pieces. So making sure that both of those things are equally as important and equally as accessible to both the, uh, the individual and the manager to make sure that they're on track and they know what success looks like. I'm not expecting you to draft an entire compensation plan in three minutes, but I want you to write down some points kind of based on what we've talked about. So think about what the levers are that you have to pull within your organization. Um, think about how it is that those kind of pieces align with the specific role that, you're th that you thought about earlier, and just write some bullet points down. So not an entire plan, but just write some bullet points down um, based on those things. Did anyone come up with any interesting levers they'd want to share? Flexible schedule. Sometimes. Yeah, working remotely is a huge, huge thing that is going to only increase kind of with, uh, with this next generation. Yeah. How does anybody handle it? Anyone want to comment on how they handle remote work? I can speak to it, but anyone else? <laughs> yeah, Reba, why don't you talk about how they handle remote work? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'm a really big believer in not measuring productivity based on bums and seats. And so if you can kind of make performance metrics kind of really clear and transparent and people know kind of what it is they need to do, then I don't care where they work, how they work, when they work. Um, if things start to go off the rails, that becomes a bit of a different conversation. But I mean, with the Common Skew team, like a third of it, well, the team is remote. So that's just started to become like a function of how it is that we now work as a company. And you start to structure kind of different communication methods around that. So we use, you know, Google Hangout videos all the time. Um, we use, you know, things like Slack or the Common Skew feed or very other ways of kind of communicating with each other to make sure that people still feel connected and part of the team and that they have the support they need. Um, but ultimately, they have the space to get done what they need to get done. Yeah, Ben. I think that, I mean, when it, it comes down to, if you, if you can get the right person in the seat on the bus, then that trust kind of comes inherent with that. And 
they know what they need to get done. And, when the, and it goes back to what you know, Jake was saying this morning, like the empowerment and kind of allowing people to, to be kind of masters of their own destiny and to be able to make decisions and to make commitments on behalf of the organization, that all of that plays a huge role in kind of overall kind of job satisfaction and, and effectiveness. So um, figure out you know, what it is that you need to put in place from a management perspective to feel comfortable kind of with those things so that trust is there. Okay, so last section here, retention and development. I can't emphasize enough the importance of charting a career path, particularly if you're bringing someone junior into an organization and you're a small company, and it's sometimes not as obvious in terms of what it is that those stages are that come next. We made a lot of mistakes about this in the early days of Right Sleeve of not actually making it clear as to what kind of a, that a next step existed um, for someone coming in, and we're still learning kind of from this, these friends. Um, but being able to kind of uh, indicate, you know, what it is that success looks like, to be able to have someone make someone feel as if there is an opportunity for them to grow and learn and develop. Going back to the same study, how millennials, 45% feel they get no leadership development and think their current skills will be inadequate in three years. That means 45% of your team, of that, of that kind of demographic, is likely feeling kind of disengaged. So one of the most important kind of shifts kind of in overall kind of management in the next little while is thinking about how you, can you spend more of your time kind of developing your team and get the things off your plate that are not kind of, that can, or that can free up your time to do more of that because you are gonna get far more impact out of investing that kind of time than anything else that you do as an owner and a manager within a company. If we look at the overall impact kind of on this, um, starting with like product training. If you spend, uh, spend time kind of training um, an individual on just product, the increment, um, incremental value of that is plus 10. If you spend time on technical training, so things like process and kind of how to do stuff, tools that they're using kind of within um, their role, the impact on that is times 10. If you spend time on personal development, 10x return, 10 to the power of x, exponential return on what it is that you're gonna get on spending time on personal development. So what does personal development mean? That means things like leadership. It means things like coaching. It means things like confidence building. Um, you know, sales training, things that are going to help them kind of be more successful as an individual and how it is that they grow within an organization. So how can you think about um, structuring time around what it is that you can offer an individual that's going to make them feel as if you are investing in this? So way too much time is spent on those first few things and you're not getting anywhere near the impact for those two things as you get by spending time on that last bucket on the personal development. So what are some, um, sorry, one other thing that I want to say on this in terms of that falls into the, the bucket kind of a personal development. This is a study that was done, um, US you know, non-farm labor productivity statistics that are gathered in this. You see this incredible bump between 2008 and 2010 in terms of productivity. This happens to coincide with when the iPhone was introduced and we now had computers kind of in our pockets and that enabled this big bump in productivity. And what have we seen since then? This, like, particularly in these latter kind of couple years, a leveling off, in some cases a dipping, and what this is indicative of is that you now have a workforce that is so used to having kind of this thing in their pocket that is so distracting and that occupies such a huge amount of headspace that they don't actually know how to use it, how to be more productive kind of by, because of the noise that's happening around them all the time. So one of the things that I can't emphasize enough in terms of personal development for your team is teaching them how to use their time effectively and teaching them how to be productive. Don't take it for granted that they know this kind of coming into an organization, particularly for people that have never worked in an office environment. They don't have experience with figuring out how it is to structure their day and how to be productive. In our office, the phones are out on the desk kind of all the time. And there's this constant like, ooh, you know, notification, ooh, so, you know, a text message came through like squirrel, you know what I mean? especially salespeople who are so distractible already that the minute they take a look kind of at that phone, they have left the building in terms of what it is that they were working on. And for them to do that context switching back from that you know, text or whatever that notification was in their phone back to what it is that they were working on, they lose kind of on average you know, a minute every time. So multiply that. You know with that, that new um, screen time tracker that Apple launched with the new iOS update? Um, I would encourage all of you to take a look at that. It's utterly fascinating in terms of how many times you pick up your phone during the day. Teach your team how to use that too. 
the, that constant context switching, that back to the, the computer, look at the phone, back to the computer, you are losing probably a total of hours within the day just simply because of that. So it's, it's not saying, you know, don't use your phone at work. It's not saying that at all. It's teaching them how to carve out time to focus. You know, put the phone in the drawer for 20 minutes. Like, ha teach them kind of how to take that distraction out. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> So that ultimately, <clears throat> you're giving them the tools. Sorry, guys. <coughs> I've got water. Thank you. <clears throat> Those are the kinds of things <clears throat> that are going to have exponential impact. Excuse me, in terms of personal development. Okay. What are things that you can point to? <clears throat> you don't have to have an HR department within your company to accomplish this kind of stuff. <clears throat> there are a million courses online that you can point people to. If they're excited about developing particular skills <clears throat> or getting better at time management, there is so much available online. YouTube, MOOCs, things that you can point to. Don't think that this necessarily has to be something that you have in-house. Blogs, books, and podcasts. To what Rod was saying earlier, be a voracious reader yourself. And if you are doing that and you're listening to amazing podcasts and you're reading great things, <clears throat> share those things with your team. Share that stuff on the Commons Key community too. If you've come across like an amazing book or a post that you've read about, put that kind of stuff on the community. Help kind of surface those kinds of amazing tools and let others share that within their organizations too. Last thing, you guys get the benefit of doing kind of peer-to-peer -peer discussions and networking when you're here, when you're at SKUCon, when you're you know, throughout the year. Your teams don't necessarily get that. So think about how could you connect someone on your team to someone else on someone else's team in this room that are at similar levels, so you know, an account coordinator to an account coordinator as an example. So they've got someone to talk to outside of their organization that they might learn from. What can they share in terms of best practices or how they're thinking about doing things? And ultimately be able to get that benefit of having some outside perspective outside their own company. So have those kind of conversations today. Think about what are roles that you're trying to develop within your own organization um, <clears throat> that could benefit from that. Sorry, guys. <coughs> and lastly, <clears throat> mentorship. <coughs> Things like Promo Kitchen. <coughs> Breathe. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, Things like Promo Kitchen that have um, mentorship programs set up, take advantage of that <clears throat> or find those relationships for your team to help them level up. Last piece I want to talk about within this <clears throat> is overall kind of performance reviews and feedback. Bobby, can you do me a favor and get me some more water? <laughs> thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> These are awesome. Um, a performance review is not something that should happen once a year. And I've got to be able to open the lid on this. <coughs> Here, it's not too hot. Just take a couple sips. Oh. <laughs> it's slim and shallow. I, I went to go speak to uh, Elizabeth, and she. Thank you. It tastes good. It tastes fabulous. Thank you. And now a double fist. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> okay, performance reviews. This is not something that should take place once a year. Feedback should be something that is offered on an ongoing basis. There should never be any surprises when you sit down at the end of the year to do a performance review. A performance review should be essentially a summary of all the things that have gone on during the year. But the most important thing during that time is to talk about upcoming development and opportunities for growth. So what... Um, Sorry, now I've got to free up my hand to use the clicker. <laughs> what does feedback look like? A joke that when, um, with a, from a parenting perspective, when you're trying to teach a toddler not to do something, they're in that phase where all they want to do is like push buttons and touch things, that as opposed to just saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, is telling them what to do, is taking them and redirecting them to something that they can do. Same thing applies kind of in, a, in a work environment. 
be focus on kind of being prescriptive around what it is that good kind of behavior looks like as opposed to saying what someone shouldn't do. So feedback should be kind of specific and should also be actionable. What can they do tomorrow in terms of behavior change, something else that will result in a different outcome that is something measurable that ultimately you could sit down and talk to them about, you know, a couple weeks later to define kind of whether or not improvement has been had there. So specific and actionable. Balanced feedback does not mean giving the shit sandwich every time. <clears throat> Don't be so predictable that every time you sit down and give feedback, you're going to say something nice and then you're going to put the shit in the middle of the being constructive and say something nice at the end to make them feel better. No, that doesn't have to be how feedback is given every time. When I say balanced, I mean find a good mix between kind of constructive and and, uh, and positive. It doesn't have to mean at the same time every time. If you're all, always only giving positive feedback, the person's going to think, I don't have an opportunity to grow here. So there's got to be something kind of constructive in there, otherwise they should be moving on to a uh, promoted to a new role. If you're only ever giving negative feedback, they're going to start to feel really deflated and that's uh, it's really, really demotivating. So try and find ways to be able to kind of highlight things in the moment when they're happening. Don't wait like to sit down kind of in a meeting, you know, a week after you saw something because at that point it's old news. Recognize it in the moment, either from a positive perspective or for a constructive for, from a constructive perspective. Things like your internal company feed for common SKU users, this is a very, very powerful place to be able to give feedback in the moment. When you see somebody doing the kind of behavior that is great, whether that's going out and, you know, frequency of visits to clients as an example, um, going and doing something that is like surprise and delight in terms of, you know, dropping off, uh, you know, cupcakes or like juice or something at a client, recognize that in the moment by commenting on it on the feed and highlighting that as great behavior so that others see it too. Same thing with, you know, if there's a great win, a you know, great order just went in. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big order. It could be something that you know that someone worked hard on. Recognizing that stuff in the moment is incredibly powerful and makes people feel great. The last piece is frequency. So, as I say, this should be something that you're doing all the time. This is not kind of a once a year sit down. You may be thinking some of the stuff in your head in terms of rec recognizing that good behavior um, or getting excited or, or um, recognizing that someone's doing something good but you aren't actually vocalizing it. So think about vocalizing it more regularly. Pull someone aside and tell them kind of when they did something great. You know, give them recognition in front of the team. So do this stuff frequently and regularly, especially again going back to this millennial stat, they are um, a generation that really, really likes praise and kind of and also feedback in general, whether that's um, constructive as well. So try and get in the habit of doing it more and more regularly and more vocally. Okay, back to work. 360 reviews. Um, when you are doing a performance review, you only have one perspective on the performance of the individual that you are managing. What is almost more important is the perspective of the others that they are working on, their impact on the other seats on the bus. If you have a small team, it could be very interesting to go and actually interview a customer as to how it is that that what that individual's impact is on the customer's um, role. So getting that outside perspective on those that kind of work with that individual is incredibly important to being able to give kind of balanced um, feedback. So the composition of a 360 in terms of what it is that makes it likely that people will actually fill it out <laughs> within the organization make it easy, but including it most importantly, what matters to you as a company? for that particular role. What is it that you need to see in terms of that individual's behavior um, or, or success that ultimately is going to be something that you want to hear from others how they're doing on that topic? What are the core values of your organization that you want to see reflected kind of within that person's performance? And lastly, when I say improvement, I don't mean improvement for the individual that you're, um, that you're reviewing. I mean, ask the question, what can that person be doing to help you be more successful? So the person who is answering that 360, so the person that is working with the individual that you're reviewing, what, what feedback can they give that, that the person that you're reviewing can be doing to help them be more successful and how does they interact in that role? So three minutes, write down three questions that you could ask in a 360. Okay, putting it all together. One thing we haven't talked about within this is you what your role is as the manager um, within this. One of the key pieces in terms of building a high performance team is what your role and your impact is within that. So you can surround yourself with the most amazing team members, but ultimately if you aren't the one kind of driving the bus in the right direction and you aren't putting that trust and empowerment within your team, then the bus is not going to go very fast or very far. 
So take some time to kind of self-reflect within all this in terms of what can you be doing better as a manager to help empower your team more, to help create more trust, to help think about more flexibility within the environment, to develop things more around kind of how you can be supporting personal development. So what are things that you specifically need to work on and what resources can you look at to be able to help you kind of get better within that? So have some of those conversations you know, over the next couple of days around what others are doing. Um, to kind of level up themselves kind of as managers, your role will continue to change and evolve as your company grows, and you constantly have to figure out how to be kind of a new manager or a new CEO at every stage along the way. So take advantage of kind of the wealth of knowledge within this room or within the broader community around how to continue kind of to develop yourself. The last piece in this is in terms of keeping kind of the team aligned is that Organizations are like kind of organisms. They're constantly kind of growing and changing. And each person kind of in that seat in the bus is constantly going through new things within their own life or within their own development. So kind of doing this you know, plan like once a year is, is not going to work. You need to be constantly looking at how each person, each, each role is changing and how to continue to kind of keep the momentum going on that, to look at kind of where you can shift people into different seats, how you can keep kind of growing them. And Think about how you know the impact on those changes kind of within the overall organization, so that ultimately you can keep everyone aligned and keep that kind of boat you know rowing in the in the same direction, and keep that momentum going. So I saved a bunch of time at the end, not just to keep myself from coughing, but to <laughs> to be able. Thank you for your patience with that. Um, to be able to have some Q and A and some experience sharing. Kind of, I'm not the expert in all this necessarily. There are lots of you, I'm sure, that have had kind of amazing knowledge and experience kind of in in this area. So would love to open up the floor to some questions or people to kind of offer up some things that have worked for them in this topic area. Pierre. Absolutely, and I think that one of the dangers um, initially is kind of hiring in your own reflection. Is that you know you think that oh you know I, I want to hire someone like me, and so you kind of go to a pool of candidates that looks like you, whether that's hiring at your you know school that you graduated from or whatever the case may be. And it's incredibly powerful when you surround yourself with people that come from totally different backgrounds. And I think it makes an organization so much better kind of when you have those differences in perspective. And it's not just a matter of you know gender and age; it's a matter of kind of background and and overall kind of life experiences that contribute to that. So definitely being conscious about it. Absolutely, but that goes to actually thinking about where it is that you're hiring from. So you know where you post the job, um, how it is that you get the word out there. Because what will happen, kind of within a you know a homogeneous network, is that if you continue to just use that as a, your referral source, then the network just continues. The pool continues to look more homogeneous. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, aftermarket. <laughs> Used cars. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Rod? <laughs> um, I think that there's um, pre-owned. <laughs> um, there's two things that I would say to that. Uh, one of which is. I think that there is kind of an onus and an obligation to, on the person who is reaching that stage to think about how do they continue to keep themselves relevant. And whether that's upskilling, whether that's continued continuous learning, um, whether that's kind of developing new kind of capabilities to keep up with technology. Um, often where kind of you see this like ageism in hiring is where someone feels as if like that person's thinking is old or they don't have the skills that I need to be able to take things to the next level. And, if that, that individual is able to kind of keep up and to upskill, then what, they, what that creates is like a magical combination of a wealth of experience and knowledge, but that ability to apply it kind of in the relevance of today. So I think that that's a huge, huge problem right now in terms of not just in terms of age, but also in terms of changing jobs and with what you know, AI and robotics and all those kinds of things are going to have in terms of an impact that there is an enormous need to kind of upskill um, within the workforce in general. So um, think about what that means kind of as a manager that
that what can you be offering and encouraging kind of of those people that are in that stage in their life to continue to be thinking about that kind of things so that they can continue to be attractive kind of as a demographic to hire. Can you guys hear, by the way? Not very well, hey. sorry. Um, uh, working remotely and managing someone at the same time, because uh, I hired someone uh, just a few months before I started that. Uh, and so at first, I found I was trying to give it immediate feedback over GChat, and, and sometimes the tone wasn't working. <laughs> you know, like, and, and um, so, like, any, uh, I have tried different things, and Yeah, I think um, this is the power of, of Hangout videos. Yeah. And just, it's amazing how things get misinterpreted when, you know, when, you, when it's just verbal. And being able to read people's faces and emotions and try and replicate that equivalent of kind of sitting down with someone. It's so easy now with technology, just you know, click the video button and close instead of starting to type and have that be kind of a regular method of communication that I think that basically, it, it creates a similar environment as if you were sitting and also ensures that they're kind of getting the tone right. Um, yeah. Yeah, Lisa. You know what was a great stat that came out of that study? Um, is that uh, millennials felt that after seven months on the job that, that, that they were considered loyal to the company. <laughs> it's amazing, <laughs> seven months. <laughs> I think that there's two there's two pieces to that. There's um there's the notion that there's there's going to be a much more kind of I would say free flowing kind of flow of talent. You're gonna have people coming in and out of your organization probably a lot more than what may have happened you know ten years ago. Just in the basis that you know an average kind of tenure in a role um, for that generation is now more like two years kind of at the most. So um, what can you do to mitigate against that is that by being able to show kind of that you're committed to development, committed to creating a career path, kind of committed to advancing that person, that's going to make them far more interested in staying at the organization, but it's also creating that alignment in terms of what motivates them. So you know, purpose, mission, all of those things are so important and being able to make them feel as if they're contributing and they're part of an organization, um, that being able to paint that picture and show kind of how it is that they fit into the equation. How many of you um, share things like overall kind of company goals with the whole team? That's a really, really important thing to understand kind of where someone fits into the puzzle and to make them feel as if they're contributing to the team overall. We sit down and do that every Monday morning. And I think that there's a, an amazing kind of rhythm with that of kind of understanding um, how it is that what they are doing on a day in and day, day, day in and day out basis kind of rolls up to that broader mission. Um, but also think about kind of what are um, pieces around whether it's kind of community things or giving back or other things that create that broader sense of purpose that can help create better engagement and therefore likely increase the longevity of how long someone wants to stay. I think we have time for one more question. Ooh, oh, sorry, you had it in the back, David. Yeah, I mean, I think that that, that whole self-reflection piece in terms of knowing what it is that you are good at as a manager, some people, some owners, like, don't like managing people at all. <laughs> that does, that's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just knowing that that's not something that you get joy out of. Find someone else, hire someone else who does like doing that. So thinking about, you know, what your own strengths are that you bring to the table, 
Um, but I thought Mike Michalowicz's point this morning was brilliant around kind of the whole like not not trying to make your own weaknesses better. It's like playing to your strengths and being able to kind of um, compensate for your weaknesses by bringing others in who are better than that. And that ultimately you know hugely contributes to a high performing team because you're not trying to kind of spend all your time getting better at something that ultimately you don't enjoy doing and that you're shitty at. Um, are we out of time? We're out of time. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank, thank you, you very much, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs>